Thank you very much for the invitation. 350 years, this is very impressive. And I think also it's very nice to be here in this beautiful building. And I think everybody who's a student here should really enjoy it to study in such a historical environment. And I'm also very happy to be here to um, talk about women. Now, as I've heard so much about gender, I feel almost like guilty not talking about men. And uh, I would have loved to instantly engage with Joshua on a, on a discussion on how stereotypes and gender are used in mediation. Maybe we come to that in the, in the discussion, both actually positively and negatively. Um, what I want to talk about is really the question, is the world a better place when there are more women involved in peacemaking? And I would like to really make a question mark because I would like into the evidence. So what do we have in terms of evidence? What makes, is it really that simple to say there's more women, there's more peace? Um, what are the, what's the evidence we have? And uh, what does that mean also for a Swedish foreign policy? That is a feminist foreign policy, as we heard quite impressively. And I think it was also very helpful to me to hear that from you, uh, what really makes the implementation of it and what can we contribute from the research community to help you implement this agenda? Um, is the question, where are the women, the right question? I mean, you can say yes, of course, because we have heard all this, there's a rights-based approach to it, there's a gender approach to it, you have all sorts of arguments. But what we actually found in our research was, um, it's not really the right question, in the sense that, we have found so many peace processes where you had actually a quite good amount of, of women present, but there was no difference. And when we first did the study that um, you co just quoted, we were actually asked by you and women for the global study to contribute with data. And I'm not a gender expert, I can, and can say so. I know by now I think a lot about women. And um, we have a big data set on a lot of peace processes, more than 40, and we have looked into what has worked, what has not worked for all actors involved, basically um, looking into different groups of actors. And then we have been asked, like, can you isolate the women and study what they have contributed? And of course, the assumption was that the outcome is like um, more women, more peace, and then to show it in more detail how this peace looks like. So the first run of our data, which is all qualitative data, very in-depth, looking into all these processes, what women have done, was there was no difference. There were more women, there were less women, there was no correlation between whether there were more agreements reached or this. So we thought, like, this is really a pity. <laughs> But what can you do? That's the evidence. So as a researcher, you have not a normative agenda, you just have data. So, but I thought, like, let's not give up. Let's dig deeper. Maybe we find something. And then what we found was really interesting. What we found is the more women had influence on the peacemaking process, suddenly you had a much higher rate of peace agreements reached and even higher implementation. So we thought, like, how, how, how come? What does this influence mean? And that was really striking that we suddenly saw what was the discussion that was going on in sort of the literature and the academic world. And what we found in the academic world was a lot of counting. So and so many women at the table, so and so many this, so and so many this. One woman at the table, higher likelihood of third percent of finding this. And you think, really? One woman makes this. So what we found is basically, it's not like that. First of all, women are at the table, yes. But are they also making decisions? Like what you said. And what we found is, for example, you have very often the discussion is, let's have more women in the delegations of the conflict parties. You showed the picture of Syria, hardly any. Yes, but what we found is when we had delegations, like in the Nepali constitution negotiations, by the way, there were a lot of women in the delegation. They had a quota. We had them in Yemen. And when you study those, you see suddenly that mostly the women involved are following the party line. So it's exactly like you said, they're not there because of their gender, they're there because they are politicians. And they follow the line of the party. So by thinking you include women, you not necessarily include women and get women politics and some differences. Because they're very equal, like men, and on top of it, they usually even feel more pressure to behave like men, and because to behave like as a party disciplinary person. So what we found is, on the contrary, and that was really interesting, 
when you have women-only delegations, like you had in Northern Ireland, suddenly you get the women activists in, and they say, we want, we want, we want. And this has a much greater effect on having just more women. So it's really the nitty-gritty details of what we push. What we found, for example, um, women are often pushed in observer status roles. You see also now very popular women advisory bodies, like we have in Syria. And uh, the UN starts setting up more women advisory bodies. And uh, we cannot say at the moment, it would be not doing justice to the instrument to say it hasn't worked. But we can say, so far, the record is not very telling in that sense that you can ask women, and very often we find women in consultative bodies, and then the mediators can say, we've asked them, it's so important. And that's also a change we see in the policy world. The normative pressure from 3025 is really working. People in high-level peacemaking feel obliged to tackle the women question, not gender, women. And they think about, like, how many do we have so that the Swedes stop talking and the Swedes stop pushing us? And the Swedes stop pushing the Security Council and the Swedes still fund the UN? And so, you have an impact. But you can have more, I tell you later. <laughs> because, <laughs> because often what we see is that then governments who have an agenda of pushing for inclusion and gender, they are not tough enough, in my view. In that sense that, oh yes, there's a women advisory body. This is nice, the women are heard, let's consult them. But it doesn't tell you anything whether they have access to decision making. So why not having them at the table? Why not having a women's only delegation? Why not having consultative bodies that have an influence? So, there's, so we found a lot of means of how women and all the other people actually, also civil society and other groups, can have an influence. For example, when you have a consultative body, you had one in Kenya that um, was set up, it's set up by itself. But Kofi Annan and Kwasa Machel, as mediators, every day consulted them, because the two parties, they didn't want to have a consultative body. So the mediators just went to them and every day said, what is it what you want? But they were smart. They made proposals, very concrete, and handed them over. And that's what we said. When these proposals were handed over very concretely, they had an impact. While in Colombia, you have the Victims Forum, 60% of women. It's also a very interesting story. How did the 60% of women come? It was actually the UN. One person in the UN said, like, the statistics, he, ha he hasn't read your book. So he thought women were overproportional victims of war. So he basically said, why not having 100% women in the victim forum? An outcry. 100% women? Are you completely insane? And that was really interesting because the whole discussion then turned into how many percentage? And they ended up with 60. So I always tell the women, like, all the women groups I know, they lobby for 30 or 35%. I said, lobby for 80. They will all hate you, but they give you 50. So this is what you can do more, for example. Push the women, push them. And and this is really, it's really interesting. Nobody ever knows. We try to really trace that, where the 30% come from. That so many groups say, we want 30% or 35%. There's no tracing. There's no, it, it just doesn't make sense. It seems to be the, the most that is perceived that men can take. It, it must be something like that. So what we see is, if women are involved, and I would like to mention also another, even if it sounds technical, commissions. How are peace agreements implemented? They are implemented in all sorts of implementation commissions. And what we found very interesting, in the mediation community, nobody looks into these implementation commissions because they are after. We're only interested in the, in the big deal that is in TV, and, and then we are also interested in gender provisions. We don't look what else women do. It's about gender provisions, as if women are only there to put in women or gender provisions in peace agreements. If we see these commissions inclusive, and this is really in an overarching thing, inclusive by gender, by geographical, by, re by religion, by ethnic proportion, we had this in Liberia or Kenya, for example, then you see these commissions functioning much better and really contributing to a much more sustainable implementation of peace agreements. But we also found if these provisions for inclusions are not set already in the beginning in the peace agreement, it never happens. We screened agreements for like what is meant to be inclusive after the war. And it's really interesting that most peace agreements have actually a clause that says it should be inclusive. 
somehow. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's never implemented usually. And that's also something what we find is, especially those things that women and civil society lobby for have, are not very often implemented because there's not so much monitoring. Another thing you can link to your foreign policy, invest in monitoring, both official monitoring, but also monitoring by women and by civil society groups, because the gains that are achieved need to be sustained. If it's not monitored, it's not sustained. But I would like to mention also, so those women that now sit, for example, we just have finalized a big project for the mediation unit of uh, the UN, looking into national dialogues. We studied 20 national dialogues and, for example, we found that most decision-making bodies are very male-dominated, while you have very inclusive setups with a lot of women usually represented. But who makes all the decisions? It's either, it's usually the usual male leaders, but interestingly, they make these decisions either formally inside the dialogues, but mostly outside the dialogues. So you can discuss whatever you want, it's representative, but the power is outside. And it's very interesting that the mediation community is pretty ignorant to the dimension of power, which is very interesting because you think like diplomacy, power is very interlinked, but power is not a very studied subject and not very looked at also when it comes to these processes. We look very much into the formalities and not where the real power is. And I think this is another thing where I think a feminist foreign policy is open to power and looks into power and how power can be influenced. And I think this is very interesting also with the opportunity Sweden has now in making a holistic policy, looking into the Security Council, looking into the EU, looking into different UN missions and, and all this to influence this in parallel. Because what we have seen when we look into what is the difference that women make, and interestingly, most of the research looked into what have women contributed to gender and women provisions. And they have contributed a lot to this. But nobody looked into what else have they done, because it was completely focused on women are there to look into women and gender uh, issues. What we found is that women as a collective group, when they were jointly together, they, they have more than any other group um, pushed for peace agreements to, to be signed pushed for peace negotiations to be started, pushed for ending violence. And they have that proportionally done more than any other actor. And I think that's, that's quite striking. And they have also pushed for gender, but I think it is also something yet to be studied more, the Gender Commission and the Colombian Peace Agreement, I think is, is much more easy to have an official commission that looks into gender mainstreaming as putting it all on the women, as if only the women are responsible for gender. What else did we find? We also find like whatever is there on, on women and what can they influence and how and all the nitty gritty details, how the selection criteria are done. I don't want to even bore you with all these thick details. Again, power. If the power relations in a situation of war and peace are not dealt with, if you take the national dialogue in Yemen that basically had a successful ending, was very inclusive, but the power players at the end didn't agree to ever implement the results. So have the actors involved internationally taken care enough of that? Difficult to say at hindsight, but I think if, how do we, from a, let's say, gender focus in mediation, we also need to look into the peace process as such. There's no help if the peace process is wonderful, inclusive, and all the women and men are there, but there's no peace. So we need to, at the same time, look into the conditions that are there that makes mediation and peacemaking a successful endeavor. And this is what we often see in our policy work, that people who look into the gender focus are happy if there are only enough women and the gender representation is fine. Instead of looking, is the entire process on the right way? And what can we do, both with an inclusive politics to stabilize the whole thing. I think that's something where I think also gender expert needs much more work hand in hand with mediation experts. Very briefly uh, to finalize, what is it, what this all means for practice? I think I mentioned it already. It's a more strategic, holistic approach to it. That as you said, it's smart 
to have an inclusive politics. It's not just a normative obligation. I've seen, we have done, um, been invited to high-level mediation trainings by the UN. You talk to special envoys and they all bought the message. I mean, at least they say so. <laughs> But you will not find a special envoy who says, like, this is, this is not important. But they all struggle with, like, how to really do it in a smart way. And they struggle with, I have to bring a peace agreement. And, and you were very right to say, like, it's not just a mediator. But interestingly, it's often still seen as this, this person. It's all in his, his hands. And um, we have seen also, like, there's a discussion going on, should there be more female mediators? Of course, I think that's a given. But you talk to the UN, they say, it's the member states not, not giving us enough females. And, the, and then the member states say, the UN is not appointing. Instead of saying like, what we have seen in our research, teams of mediators have been much more effective than this one guy. So why not just saying there should be always a man and a woman represented in the mission? UN says, too hard to coordinate. You say, like, well, I mean, how complex is peacemaking? You will be able to also coordinate a man and a woman leading a peace operation. Should be doable. So I think there's also another approach I would like to mention. There's a lot of investment in capacity building, which is on the one hand good. For example, if you take the Syria Women Advisory Body, it's the most trained women group on Earth. They have, on average, every two weeks a training. I know they know everything. Unfortunately, they're not sitting at the table and have any decision-making power. So it's, we have to also think about, are these women getting the training they need? Do they need training at all? Are they not anyway very highly qualified women that brought them there at first? So very often, the international community is falling back in a project approach, because that's nice. You can give a project, you can monitor it, you can give money to it. Instead of saying, what's the strategic advice and push? which is much more unpleasant to think about how to engage the, the UN in this, how to push for this end and that end, and how to bring it all together. So I think there needs to be more courage in really going a little bit outside the comfort zone when we want to push this agenda and doing it in a, of course, diplomatic way, but being much more strategic and not just being strategic at first and then fall back to the operations of supporting only projects. And I think this is what I hope when we look in two, three years into the feminist foreign policy, that we can show, yes, Sweden is our standing example. And I tell you, they're all jealous already in, in, in Norway, in Switzerland, in Canada. So let them be jealous. So I really encourage you to keep on going with this, both in research. And I think in research, this is my last point, you should really look more into showing the evidence in the nitty-gritty details of what works, what does not work, and not and combine qualitative and quantitative research, and not only crash the numbers. Thank you very much.